And I think what people don't see is how hard Joe works every single day, that he gets up thinking what he can do for the American people. This is my video update on this Thursday, midday, January the 11th. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with Alensky's Baltic tour. Alensky is touring the Baltic nations, Lithuania, yesterday, today, Estonia. And I believe tomorrow he will be in Latvia. And I think he goes to another country after Latvia, but, but I forgot where he goes to after Latvia, maybe Poland. But um, he was in Lithuania yesterday. And according to CNN, this was a surprise visit. Ukrainian President Zelensky makes surprise visit to Lithuania to discuss war. That is according to CNN. This Lithuania trip took them by surprise, which is a bunch of bollocks, <laughs> big time bollocks there from CNN. This is no surprise visit. This is a scripted, uh, planned out trip from Zelensky to the Baltic nations in order to push the narrative that when Russia is done with Ukraine, it's then going to move on to uh, Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia and Poland and everywhere else in, in Europe. So uh, that's, that's the narrative that Alensky is pushing out to the United States and to the European Union in order to secure the $61 billion from the U.S. Congress, $50 billion from the EU, and maybe $300 billion in Russian uh, stolen assets. So this trip is scripted and planned out. And it's all about the, the, the Russia invasion after, after Ukraine, the Russia invasion of the Baltics after, after Ukraine. That's the theme, the narrative of this trip from Alensky. And Alensky, he did say some interesting things while he was in Lithuania. He said that in order to end the war, in order to stop this war, he said that uh, they need to end Putin. According to the Moscow Times, Zelensky calls for an end to Putin to stop the war. To end the war unleashed by Vladimir Putin, it is necessary to end Putin himself, Ukrainian President Zelensky said on Wednesday during a trip to Lithuania. Interesting words from the little green man. By the way, he, he, uh, he wore his best uh, sweatshirt. When he visited Lithuania, he put on his best, uh, his best sweatshirt <laughs> during his uh, state visit to Lithuania. And uh, what else did uh, Alensky say? He started to rattle off all the countries that Putin will invade once uh, he finishes with Ukraine. He said, and I quote, he will not stop until he destroys Ukraine. And if Ukraine does not defeat the Russian Federation, then Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Moldova, da 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 He will, he will invade Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia and Moldova and Poland and Slovakia and Slovenia and France and Spain and the UK and Ireland and Italy, and Greece, and Colombia, and Brazil, and Argentina, and the United States of America, and Canada. <laughs> he just went on and on and on. All the countries that Putin will invade after Ukraine. Oh, the little green man, Alensky. So Alensky did get money from uh, Lithuania. He actually got, one sec, he got $200 million in uh, long-term military aid, long-term military aid, whatever that means. <laughs> it means he's not going to get the money now. He'll get it later. But uh, Lithuania's virtue signaling, right? It's a kind of virtue signaling, it's virtue signal. Uh, 200 million in long-term aid. We support Ukraine. We're with you. We're by you. We're by your side, and we'll give you money in like four or five years if you're still around. <laughs> you know, if you're still around, 
we'll get you some military aid in five years, 200 million worth. That's what this is all about. It's kind of a failure for Olenski because he's not going to be leaving Lithuania with like a bag of money. So I guess you could say this is a failure in terms of uh, give me money goals from Olenski. But uh, here's, here's the best part of what he said. This is the best part. This should really be my clown world. But uh, Alensky said during his statements, and I quote, Our Ukrainian intuition suggests that Russia will not survive if we continue to fight it. <laughs> our, our Ukrainian intuition. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. You know things are really, really bad for Alensky when he has to rely on his Ukrainian intuition to convince the collective West to continue to fight Russia. It, give me 300 billion because my, my Ukrainian intuition, it tells me we win. Now give me money. I need to buy many homes. My Ukrainian intuition tells me I need to buy many homes in America. Because my Ukrainian intuition is telling me maybe, maybe I may need to move to America, to Miami, or Los Angeles, <laughs> or New York. But uh, yeah, that's, that's his Ukrainian intuition. That's, that's where Alensky is at. That's where he's reached uh, you, to rely on intuition. That's his selling point now. Oh, boy. So, you know, Maria Zakharova, she, she had a response to Alensky's Ukrainian intuition line. And she said, and I quote, Oh, yeah, this famous, this famous Ukrainian intuition of Zelensky, it never let him down. And everything he planned came true. He can safely rely on it and wait for the orderlies. <laughs> This should be my clown world, <laughs> man. Oh boy. Yeah, he's relying on his intuition. The hope strategy. I've been talking about the hope strategy for a while now. It looks like we've, we've gotten to that level now of, of not even the hope strategy. We've passed the hope strategy. The hope strategy is like back there. Now we're on the intuition strategy. My intuition is telling me, my intuition is telling me to, to, to fight because we're going to win. <sighs> wow, that's bad. That is a bad, bad sign. That's desperate. That's desperate, and that's that's an Alensky in panic mode. He is in panic mode because he knows he's in big trouble, in very big trouble. Right now, the only thing that's that's holding Alensky up is are the Europeans. I think. I think they're the only ones that are holding Alensky up. The Lithuanias and Latvias and Poland and, and Ursulas and Borels. I think they're the only ones that are keeping Alensky uh, propped up at the moment. The United States, I think the United States, they want him gone. The neocons, the hardline neocons, the moderate neocons, they want Alensky out. That's what my intuition is telling me anyway. Uh, Putin, well, Putin, he was traveling to the far east of, uh, of Russia, and he had a different message to the, to the people of Russia, to the world, and to the Europeans, actually. Putin basically said during his meetings in the far east that Europe, the EU, is sinking, and Russia is surging. The Russian economy is Searching, EU needs Russia more than we need them, said Putin. The leading economies of Europe are experiencing difficult times, according to the Russian president. Quote, they should think about themselves, what they will eat tomorrow, what they will wear, Putin said. They all have a ton of problems that are incompatible with our problems. Even the leading economies of Europe are going through difficult times. 
we are growing and they are in decline. As it turns out, they are more dependent on us than we are dependent on them. That is what Putin said. And he was in, he made his way to Khabarovsk. And he said during a meeting of businessmen about the Russian economy, he said, an amazing result. It seems that we are being strangled and crushed from all sides. And we have become the first in Europe in terms of economic volume as a whole. We overtook Germany and took fifth place in the world. China, USA, India, Japan, Russia. In Europe, number one. Japan, as well as many European economies, are high-tech economies. In terms of purchasing power parity, we have overtaken the whole of Europe. But per capita, we still have to try. Therefore, there is something to work on here. That was his statement to businessmen in Khabarovsk. And uh, yesterday, the Russian military, they launched uh, missile and drone strikes on the city of Kharkiv. And one of the, the targets, one of the main targets of this strike was the Park Hotel. Not to be confused with the Palace Hotel that they hit about a week and a half ago that allegedly was housing mercenaries. Uh, this time they hit a different hotel, the Park Hotel in Kharkov. And once again, the Russian military claims that mercenaries were being housed at this hotel. Ukraine uh, officials are saying that this hotel was housing uh, journalists and uh, aid workers. I believe the casualties at this moment are at 13 people injured, including one journalist from Turkey, according to Ukrainian officials. And this title from ABC News from the other day, Hospital sees 30% rise in seriously wounded Ukrainian soldiers, says doctor. As many as 100 hurt soldiers arrive daily at a Dnipro hospital, the doctor said. This is the city of Dnipro Petrovsk. And uh, this is from ABC News, everyone. This is not Russian media. This is ABC News acknowledging the huge casualties that the Ukraine military is suffering. So uh, let's, let's shift gears. We've talked about Alensky. Let's now talk about Hunter Biden, who once upon a time was uh, making business in Ukraine as a board member of Burisma the energy company, the New York Post, they ran, they ran an article the other day, which hasn't gotten much media attention. And this is coming from the New York Post, not from me, the New York Post, they ran an article talking about how Klitschko, the mayor of Ukraine, was actually a shareholder and or a board member of a subsidiary of Burisma. I think the company was called something like Geothermal, Burisma Geothermal or something like that. And uh, this company was, was started up, I think the New York Post wrote in 2015, after the Obama-Biden coup, and after uh, Hunter was appointed uh, board member of, of, of the main company, the mother company, Burisma, and they had all of that going on. It looks like, according to the New York Post, that Klitschko also got in on the action with this Burisma subsidiary. That's coming from the New York Post. So. Uh, make of it what you will. But uh, Hunter Biden, the Renaissance man known as Hunter Biden, and he really is a, a Renaissance man. And not only is he a Renaissance man, because he's, he's, he's an expert when it comes to energy and, uh, and law and venture capital and real estate, and he writes books and he paints amazing artwork. Uh, <laughs> he's very good with chemistry and mixing, mixing up stuff and He's an amazing photographer and, and you know, he, he shoots interesting videos. Um, not, not only is he a Renaissance man, he's a, he's a rebel too. He's a rebel with a cause. <laughs> he's not a rebel without a cause. He's a rebel with a cause. And uh, yesterday we saw the rebellious side of 
the Renaissance man known as Hunter. Here's the title from Zero Hedge. You are the epitome of white privilege. That's a quote. Chaos ensues after Hunter Biden crashes, contempt hearing, then flees when MTG, Marjorie Taylor Greene, speaks. Hunter Biden received quite the earful after a surprise appearance at his contempt of Congress hearing for defying a subpoena last month. What a circus this was yesterday in Congress. What a circus. <laughs> I mean, man, <laughs> talk about crazy stuff that took place in D.C. yesterday. So I don't know if you guys saw the videos. It's all over social media or heard about this story. But basically, Congress was having a hearing to, to talk about a possible hearing, about a possible hearing uh, about uh, Hunter and the fact that he didn't uh, respond to the subpoena, that he ignored the subpoena that Congress uh, sent him. <laughs> it's like a, they held like a, a preliminary hearing to the hearing to the hearing for contempt of Congress charges for, for Hunter. It's just, it's so ridiculous. The, the, the Republicans are, are, are they're, they're ridiculous, man. <laughs> they're just ridiculous. It's like they're holding, they're holding a preliminary hearing to see if they're going to have a preliminary hearing to see if they're going to have a hearing to explore another hearing for the impeachment of Biden. <laughs> That's what was taking place yesterday, right? So uh, they were they were going through the motions and and discussing whether they should consider having a possible uh, hearing about Hunter Biden for contempt of Congress and stuff like that. Uh, just, just, if you were the Democrats, just have the have the hearing, man. <laughs> just go forward with it. Go forward with the freaking thing. But nope, they're not the Democrats. That's for sure. They don't play uh, hardball. And uh, Hunter, you know, he just busted into this hearing. He ignored the subpoena. And then this guy has the cojones. <laughs> Talking big cojones, man. <laughs> and he just walks into the hearing. And he just sits down with, with his lawyers and a guy in like a purple, a purple suit. Who was that guy? <laughs> Who was that guy with Hunter? Anyway, and they just sit down. They just sit down. They cross their arms and they just, you know. They're listening to Congress talk about whether they should move forward with some type of hearing against Hunter. <laughs> I think I got this right. <laughs> That's pretty much what took place yesterday. Uh, his contempt of Congress hearing. That's what he busted in on. His contempt of Congress hearing because he defied a subpoena last month. Yeah, that was when he decided to speak uh, to the media outside of the, of the Capitol. He defied the subpoena, and instead he decided to have a press conference. And he actually talked about his art and how he wasn't using his artwork to, to, uh, to give favors out to, to various people. <laughs> what a circus. And so, you know, the funny part about this, uh, this show that took place yesterday in Congress is that you had the Republicans, like, actually... When they saw Hunter there, they actually started to, to, to yell the standard lines, you know, Hunter, uh, you're not above the law. You know, he busts into this hearing, which he was supposed to testify at. But anyway, he busts in there. He sits down and they're like, Hunter, you're not above the law. We want you to know that you're not above the law. That's what all the Republicans were saying, right? You're not above the law. You're not above the law. And I was just watching the video and I'm just like, what are you guys talking about? I mean, he, he walks into a hearing that he told you guys that he pretty much gave the middle finger to you guys about. I mean, he gave you guys the middle finger. Subpoena, take your subpoena and, <laughs> you know. And then he actually has the cojones man, to go into Congress and to sit down and just listen to, to Congress, to the Republicans, talk about whether they should move forward with, uh, with a contempt of Congress hearing about him. And he just sat there with his arms crossed. And you're going to tell me that this guy is not above the law? I mean, he's pretty much telling you, here I am, 
I am above the law. <laughs> I'm right here and I'm above the law. <laughs> I mean, man, man, <laughs> got to hand it to Hunter, man. That was, that was a power move. I mean, staged and scripted. The Democrats planned the whole thing out because the purpose of all of this, the purpose of this show was for the Democrats who were um, participating in this hearing for them to come out and say, well, here, there's Hunter, he's right there, so why don't you ask him questions right now? That was the purpose of all of this, is to just kind of make a mockery of this whole thing. And for the Democrats to say, well, he's here, ask him some questions. And so when Marjorie Taylor Greene decided to ask him some questions, Hunter got up and left. <laughs> another another F you to, to everybody, <laughs> to everybody. Oh, what a circus that was. You're not above the law, Hunter. <laughs> Bro, <laughs> if, that isn't, if that isn't a display of being above the law, I don't know what is. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know what is. Oh, man. What, what, a, what an S show that was. And then when Hunter was in the hallways of, uh, of the building of, uh, of Congress where this uh, session was taking place, he leaves the room and the media is following him, right? He's walking around the halls all big and bad with his lawyers and the guy in the purple suit. And uh, the media is like asking him questions about whether he was, he was uh, doing business with his father and whether they were giving out favors to, to donors and business people and other state actors. And then one person in the media actually asked him, uh, what kind of crack do you normally smoke, Mr. Biden? <laughs> Oh, what's happening to America, man? <laughs> what is happening to America, man? This Biden presidency, my God. My God. <sighs> what kind of crack do you normally smoke? That was the question that one of the journalists asked him. Man. Ah, sticking with, uh, with U.S. news. We got the, the word yesterday that Christie is dropping out of the Republican presidential uh, race. He is dropping out just a few days before the Iowa caucus uh, gets underway. So uh, it, it's, this is really simple. This story is really simple to dissect. Christie drops out so that they can uh, give all of the support to uh, Haley. Bump up Haley's numbers. That's it. It's that simple. This whole thing is, is also planned and staged. And it's all about propping up Haley because she is the preferred uh, candidate, not only for the Republicans, probably for the Democrats as well. That's, that's who the Uniparty wants to see as the next president of the United States of America. Democrats, Republicans, deep state, permanent state, globalists, warmongers, neocons, Hardline neocons, moderate neocons, they all want to see Nikki Haley. That's who they want. And so Christie pulls out just a couple of days before Iowa. They're hoping that Haley gets a nice bump. And if DeSantis doesn't do well in Iowa, like if Haley is ahead of DeSantis in Iowa, then uh, all, the, all the experts, all the analysts, they, they believe that uh, if DeSantis has a bad showing in Iowa, then DeSantis will drop out right ahead of, uh, of New Hampshire. And DeSantis, they're hoping that DeSantis' support will go to Haley in New Hampshire. And Haley starts picking up momentum as she tries to, to beat out Trump, who at the same time is going to have all the indictments. And um, they're going to be pushing for various states to remove Trump from the ballot. So all of this is being orchestrated in order to prevent Trump, to remove Trump, and to prop up Haley. This is all staged. This is all freaking staged. Anyway, uh, South Africa. South Africa's case against Israel to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. I think it uh, gets started today. It's starting up today. And South Africa has asked The Hague to order Israel to stop the military onslaught in Gaza. This is according to Politico. Israel argues that its actions in Gaza are legal self-defense after Hamas's attack. 
So, you know, this uh, ICJ uh, case that is being brought up against Israel by South Africa, this has been a, a brilliant move on the part of South Africa. And it looks like this, this case has, has merit, has teeth. Even though Blinken, when he was in uh, Israel the other day, he said that this case, this ICJ case brought up by South Africa is meritless. And Israeli officials, they have been putting out statements almost daily saying that this case by South Africa has no merit. But you know, when they start uh, making these statements almost on a daily basis that this has no merit, you know that this case has merit and you know that they are very worried. The United States and Israel, they're very worried and they're very panicky about this uh, ICJ case against Israel that South Africa is bringing. And uh, the case is building up momentum and support. There are a bunch of countries now that are supporting South Africa's case before the International Court of Justice. Uh, the case accuses Israel of committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. And the countries that are supporting this case now are Malaysia, Turkey, Bolivia, Nicaragua, the Maldives, Venezuela, Namibia, Jordan, Morocco, Iran, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and just the other day, Saudi Arabia got on board. Which is so interesting because Blinken was just in Saudi Arabia and his pitch to MBS was for Saudi Arabia to restart their uh, recognition of Israel, the reprochement that they had going on with Israel before October 7th. He told MBS, let's get that going again. And if you get that going again, and when I go to Israel, I'll push the two-state solution for uh, Palestine, for the Palestinians. That was, that was basically the, the bargain that Blinken was pushing with Saudi Arabia. You start up uh, diplomatic relations with Israel again. And when I go to Israel, I'll, I'll try to find a way to, to get a solution to Gaza and two-state solution, find a way to get that back on track. And then you have Saudi Arabia joining the, uh, the ICJ case brought by South Africa. Very interesting development. And just to show how isolated the U.S. has become in the Middle East, they actually asked Djibouti to, uh, to place missile launchers so that they can hit out at... Uh, at Yemen and the Houthis, who, uh, who are preventing the, the ships from moving through the Red Sea. And so the U.S. is like, look, we need to put missiles in Djibouti. Is that okay? And you want to know what uh, Djibouti told the U.S.? No. Nope. Request rejected. You're not going to use our territory to launch missiles against the Houthis and Yemen. An amazing development there, an absolutely amazing development showcases how isolated the United States has become in the region. Okay, let's, uh, let's do a clown world. And in this clown world, we have to talk about Boris Johnson, the king of clowns, Bojo. So Boris Johnson, he gave an interview to the UK Times and the title of this article from the UK Times. I believe this was an interview, an exclusive interview with the Times, but uh, they're running with the article, Johnson embroiled in war of words over sabotaged Ukraine peace deal. Former prime minister dismisses the allegation that he ordered President Alensky to continue the war as total nonsense and Russian propaganda. So. The Times runs this article, does this interview with Johnson, gets these state statements from Johnson, refuting the, the narrative that he flew to Kiev in, um, in late March, early April 2022 to tell Alensky to, to scrap the deal that they had just negotiated with Russia for a ceasefire to the conflict or for a framework, a framework to a ceasefire to the conflict because uh, the UK, the US, the entire collective West, they'll give you all the weapons and all the money that you want. And we're gonna place sanctions on Russia. We're going to remove Putin. And so get rid of the, the negotiated ceasefire 
framework uh, deal and, uh, and just do what we tell you to do. Um, tell the Russians to buzz off, ramp up the war, ramp up the fighting, and we'll get a regime change in Russia and all will be good. Those are the claims that many, many people, including many officials at the negotiations with Russia, claim happened. I mean, we actually have like witnesses to all the events coming out and saying that's what happened. We had a deal and Boris flew into town and he ruined that deal on the promise that collective West support and money and weapons and sanctions would lead to an Alensky victory. So Boris gives this interview to the Times. He refutes this entire narrative and he says no such thing happened. But as Boris refutes this narrative, he actually admits that it did happen in the same interview. So here is a tweet from uh, Zlaty71 explaining what the Times is reporting and what Boris Johnson told the Times with regards to his meeting with Zelensky in 2022. Johnson said that after the meeting of representatives of the Russian and Ukrainian delegations in Istanbul in 2022, he held talks with Ukrainian President Zelensky, during which he expressed his concern about the possibility of an agreement between Moscow and Kiev. According to Johnson, he also stressed that the UK was a thousand percent ready to help Ukraine. Interestingly, in the same interview, the former prime minister said that he had nothing to do with the disruption of peace talks between Russia and Ukraine in spring 2022. Johnson said he thought the information about his involvement was complete nonsense and Russian propaganda. <laughs> yeah. So in the same article, Johnson says that he flew to Kiev, held private talks with Olensky, told Olensky that uh, the West has his back 1,000%, 1,000% ready to help Ukraine. And then in the same interview, he said that any narrative about him ruining the, the ceasefire is Russian propaganda. In the same article. <laughs> oh, man, what a clown, man. What a clown, Boris Johnson. Uh, that's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. Pick up a hoodie, pick up a t shirt. 15% uh, off all t shirts. Take care.